Right. As a young teenager, when I first got interested in the American Civil War, it was probably this place that fascinated me more than any other uh, in the history of Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain's Civil War career. More than Little Round Top, more than uh, more than Petersburg, more than Appomattox Courthouse. It's here at Lewis Farm where he's going to receive one of these quizzical wounds that goes up his arm, through his, through his jacket, and supposedly knocks one of his staff officers off his horse behind him, and then he knocks, he falls out, uh, passes out from the, from, the, from the blow. And it's here that Charles Griffin's gonna ride up next to him and say, General, you are gone, seeing his troops rallying and uh, running away. And, gen and it's at that moment that Chamberlain will wake up and say, you're right, General, I am, and lead a massive counterattack that is going to win the day here at the Battle of Quaker Road or Lewis Farm. To tell us a little bit more about that moment in American history is Will Green. Well, there's a difference between what uh, Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain wrote and what is real American history. And I think we just heard an example of that. I have the quote, since, uh, but since Doug gave most of it, uh, most of the uh, uh, salient parts of it, I won't share it with you. But Joshua Chamberlain uh, is involved in this battle, which is the first of a series of engagements that occur between March 29th and April 2nd that spell the doom of the Confederate control of Petersburg and Richmond. Now, this is the first day that the Union forces, the Second Corps and the Fifth Corps and Sheridan's Cavalry Corps are the, are the action elements of Grant's Army Group that's going to be moving uh, to try to capture the Boyden Plank Road and the Southside Railroad, General Lee's two remaining supply lines. Now, to get you oriented, we are standing right in, I'm standing right in front of what was the Lewis House for the Lewis Farm, one of these middling Dinwiddie County tobacco farms. Uh, existed, uh, had a couple of hundred acres to it with a, a, a middle-class two-story frame house right here. The historic scene that you see over my shoulder is remarkably accurate. You take away the modern house that you see in the distance. The tree line that is in the far distance is accurate. That's where the tree line was. This is all uh, cleared ground like it, like it is today. And the federal troops would be coming up from in front of me. They moved at dawn on the 20, actually before dawn on the 29th of March, uh, marched out to a, 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 an intersection a couple of miles away from us here and halted about 1020 in the morning. There, General Warren received orders from General Meade to go forward on the road that you see over here to my right, which is the Quaker Road, named after a Quaker meeting house that used to exist along its shoulder. But Warren uh, misunderstood what Meade's intention was, and instead of sending his entire Fifth Corps up this road towards the Boyden Plank Road, a mile, a mile behind me, he only sent skirmishers. And those skirmishers would encounter the initial Confederate resistance here. That Confederate resistance consisted of the division of Bushrod Johnson, which in effect was all that was left of the Fourth Corps of the Army of Northern Virginia, commanded by Richard Heron Anderson. Well, as those skirmishers reported that there was action up here, there were some Confederate resistance, Charles Griffin, uh, in command of the lead division of the Fifth Corps, sent one of his brigades under Joshua Chamberlain up across a makeshift bridge on Gravelly Run. That was part of the reason that Meade uh, that Warren was being delayed here trying to repair that bridge. You couldn't get artillery across it. He sent Chamberlain's brigade led by the 198th Pennsylvania up to this position and here from where we're standing is where Chamberlain deployed and began having his real the real serious fight. Now the Confederates threw in a brigade at a time. Henry Wise's Virginia Brigade came on the field. Then William Wallace's South Carolina Brigade came on the field. Then Young Moody's Alabama Brigade came on the field. And finally, Matthew Ransom's North Carolina Brigade came on the field. And this was a back and forth fight. Chamberlain would move his troops from this position across that open field and counter the Confederates about at that wood line that you see in the distance. The Confederates would be pushed back and then bring up one of those other brigades and they would push Chamberlain back. Eventually, a second Union Brigade came on the field under a man named Edward Gregory uh, and one battery of artillery managed to negotiate Gravelly Run and those additional Union troops were what eventually forced Bushrod Johnson to abandon the field, leaving behind about 400 casualties. So this wasn't a big battle, 
But isn't it remarkable when we, in, in Civil War parlance, when we say 400 people were shot on one side, but it's no big deal. Yeah. Imagine if we lost 400 people in anything today, it would be a huge deal. But it, by, by the scale of battles at Petersburg, it's not a big one. But it has a number of different uh, significant consequences. One of them is that Robert E. Lee, who has been expecting that Grant is going to launch some kind of offensive, he's just waiting for it to happen, at first, when it was reported that Sheridan had reached Dinwiddie Courthouse without any opposition, he assumed this was just a cavalry raid. But now, with the appearance of the Fifth Corps here at the Lewis Farm, Lee understood this was it. This was the big one he'd been expecting and dreading. And so he started to pull out all of the stops. He moved two of his brigades, Scales Brigade and McGowan's Brigade from uh, in the interior part of, his, part of his defenses, moved them out here to the west, and that's when he summons George Pickett's division to come down to take position at Five Forks to guard the access point to the uh, Southside Railroad. At the end of this day, the Federals will control, thanks to Warren's attack and Joshua Chamberlain, uh, will control the Boyden Plank Road. So that objective is over. And now all that is left for the Union forces to cut Petersburg and General Lee off from the outside world is to capture the Southside Railroad. So, Will, when I started talking out, we're talking about this this wound that Chamberlain receives. It's one of these things, The story, as the story goes, it hits his horse. He's riding on his favorite horse, Charlemagne. It hits the horse, goes through the horse, up the arm, hits something in his, in his pocket, goes around the other side. This kind of begs a little bit of, the, begs the imagination a little bit. Is there a little bit more that you can tell of the story that doesn't come from Chamberlain's memoirs? Well, I, you know, this is mostly, uh, this is not a celebrated incident in the Fifth Corps. This is a celebrated incident in Joshua Chamberlain's very imaginative writing after the Civil War. Uh, but Chamberlain is not alone in, in, in doing these things. He was always at the center of the story. He wrote eloquently. His, anybody who's read his stuff will realize it's just brilliant stuff. Uh, was he wounded here? Yes, apparently he was wounded. I don't think it was a near-death experience like he would have you believe. Uh, he'll be wounded again at White Oak Road two days later. He'll get, he'll get another wound, but somehow he manages to survive all of these wounds. Now, the one time Chamberlain was really badly wounded was on June the 18th. Now, that was a serious wound, and they did think that Chamberlain was going to be dead as a result of that wound. Uh, so, you know, poor, poor Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain did have uh, quite a few bullets hit him during the Civil War, but I'm not so sure this was all that important one except in, uh, in Chamberlain's telling of it. You know, it's interesting, you know, we think about these things, you know, these stories that... Um, that we read about in books or that you know occasionally make it onto the screen either the small screen or the big screen and we forget that these are real places uh, and you know we're standing on the lewis farm the quaker road battlefield or the lewis farm battlefield that is the real quaker road running behind me uh, and we are actually standing on privately owned land right now so um this is a place that you know in the future could be preserved to make sure that we remember these stories uh, and it's just something that i always like to come back to is that you know, this history did actually happen. These people were real people and you can stand where they stood and in this case, see what they saw with those tree lines behind me as Will described. So I encourage you, you know, wherever possible, come out to these battlefields, see what the soldiers saw and get your little taste. I mean, even I got a little bit of chills standing out here today and I've been here before, but standing out here today and realizing this looks nothing like my backyard uh, did growing up when I was imagining these things. And it's really kind of cool to stand here and see what they actually look like and remember the people who actually fought here. So thank you for watching and thank you for supporting Battlefield Preservation.